Hi, good evening. A very warm welcome to everyone joining in uh, for our first uh, webinar for the year 2024. Wish you all a very, very happy new year. I hope you had uh, a very nice, warm celebration with your family and loved ones and you're back to work now. Uh, and we at the Outreach Collective are also back to work. It's not that far uh, uh, that we had our uh, annual uh, retreat, uh, we had our annual celebrations. But, you know, I was just talking to Bhakti. Uh, it feels like 10 days feel like ages when we are not on uh, on on our weekly Zoom calls or doing information sessions and hosting distinguished guests with us like we do today uh, in Vardhan Kabra. Uh, I am very, very honored to invite Vardhan for our first book talk uh, of the year. Vardhan Kabra is the co-founder and head of school at Fountainhead School. And he has written a, written a very, very fascinating book. Uh, I remember when I posted about us being able to host him as our first guest for 2024. And in the past, uh, as you remember, last year we hosted some very very distinguished personalities right from uh first dr c rajkumar the founding vice chancellor of the global university to uh, uh to you know uh, authors to educationists school principals uh and i think uh, what resonates with us with this book is what we have been trying to uh, put across as a community the objective uh, for the indian higher education revamp and when we Vardhan says, uh, reimagining Indian education, India needs a revolution in education and reforms won't do. Uh, he is actually uh, striking a chord with all of us because that is what we all also believe as a community. And I'm speaking on behalf of the 300 plus the Outreach Collective members that are uh, you know, that I represent as the co-founder along with Bhakti Shah. Uh, and, and so we are going to talk about... Uh, uh, his book, we are going to talk about Vardhan is a very well known uh, face in the Indian uh, education space. He has been uh, a, 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 a revolutionary in himself. The Fountainhead schools uh, are known as uh, trendsetters, uh, 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 schools that have reimagined the way education can be done uh, in spite of all the odds that may be uh, in front of us. Uh, so I'll just First, I'd like to briefly formally introduce him and then we'll uh, jump right into the questions. Vardhan Kabra is uh, is the head of school at F Fountainhead School. He's also the co-founder there. He is a B.Tech and M.Tech uh, uh, from IIT Mumbai. Uh, he, ha he has a postgraduate diploma from IIM Ahmedabad. He co-founded uh, Fountainhead School Preschool uh, with Ankita. He has led the operations of Fountainhead School in Surat since its inception in 2008. He is responsible for the overall academics and administration of the school, the teacher training and leadership development program at Fountainhead, uh, closely monitored by him, ensures that, ensures that innovative pedagogy and student-centric education is brought into classroom practice through constant training and mentoring of teachers. Apart from that, in my previous role as the Director for Admissions and Outreach at OP Jindal Global University and before that as Head of International Outreach for Ashoka University, we always, you know, uh, Surat is that part of the country that not many of us get to visit, but Fountainhead School in Surat was the school that everybody knew that this is the school that is of uh, at par with any global school. And I have speaking on behalf of, you know, I've personally traveled to 35 plus countries, 1000 plus schools uh, to have that name uh, at such a such short interval. I mean, it's not a legacy school. It's a new school. It's 10 years is not a big time uh, in the life of a school, but to have that so it speaks volume about uh, the founders and the student quality that we used to get uh, from uh, Fountainhead was amazing. And every year we used to get students from Fountainhead School joining us, both at Jindal and at Ashoka. So I'm very, very honored to have uh, Vardhan with us here today. We are going to talk about uh, Reimagining Indian Education, his new book. And I'm joined by Bhakti, uh, who is my co-founder. Uh, she will also be chiming in the conversation as and when uh, it comes to that. But uh, Vardhan, very warm welcome uh, to this. Uh, I mean, I would like to begin not with your book, but I would like to start from the the your your first baby, which is the Fountainhead Preschool, and and then the, subsequently the school along with your wife Ankita that you co-founded. Uh, I mean, what were the gaps you were trying to address, and 
you know as i as i as i think about it i mean as i said in my initial remarks also surat is not in everybody's mind when they think of innovative schools it is always bombay bangalore or delhi or or some uh, some other place so if you could just start, start from there and then we'll subsequently move ahead yeah firstly thank you ankur and uh, bhakti for inviting me i'm i'm really happy to be here uh, to speak to uh, i mean progressive uh, educators people who uh, whether it's in school or in uh, higher education i think uh, the the, the uh, outreach collective is uh, is uh, sparking many interesting conversations i had an opportunity to go through some of the older videos uh, that have been recorded over the last year and i really found those conversations fascinating so thank you let me uh, start by answering the question about uh, why uh, fountainet preschool or school i think uh, there are two parts of it one of it is that uh, i grew up in multiple schools i studied in multiple schools across india uh, my father was in a transferable job uh, due to that we were moving every two three years and uh, my experience with education was such that i always felt that there was something lacking in education uh i was uh i was a good student uh, but i was still not enjoying it there were only very uh, small things that i would enjoy and in fact my most uh, uh, memorable enjoy uh, educational experiences came outside of school uh, like in an internship that i did in uh, the inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics in pune uh, i did a project for like two months there and i really enjoyed that because it was so much more hands on uh that uh, that was really enjoyable i mean and that's where i really enjoyed maths and science and i was good at maths and science i that's why i uh, that's how i also ended up in engineering but i didn't enjoy the maths and science which uh, we would be doing in school so that was a significant driving factor to uh, for me to think that okay uh, we need to change the way we look at education uh, it needs to be both uh, meaningful and joyful so that was trigger one and the second was uh just coming from maybe uh, uh maybe an environment uh, or uh where i just wanted to do something on my own rather than take up a job so i think those were the two driving factors to start a school uh i think it happened in surat as a choice uh i both uh, ankita is my batchmate from i am ahmedabad and i don't have any roots uh, in surat uh but we were looking at uh, essentially tier 2 cities instead of tier 1 cities because uh we didn't have a lot of uh, we didn't have essentially funding we didn't have so we didn't we, we to start a school in a metro would have been a much uh, much more of a uh, task for us uh, to figure out i mean the land and the funding for it so that's essentially the reason why we were looking at tier 2 we did look at a bunch of other places uh, we looked at jaipur and navi mumbai and chandigarh and ludhiana and jaipur and indore uh like we actually visited research spoke to people Uh, yeah, and then based on that, we decided on uh, Surat because uh, for two, three factors. One, uh, economically, uh, it's it was doing really well. This is in two thousand three, two thousand four. Ah, it's still doing quite well. So that's been a that's been a, a good decision in hindsight. And educationally, it didn't have a lot of uh, uh, good opportunities for students and parents. So that was those were like two reasons which. Uh, prompted us to be in surat and we were in amdabad right before this so uh, that also made it easier for us to understand the context and be here in surat interesting that is very very interesting so you actually did uh, did look out i i i seriously Market thought you research. had the family family roots and huh? everything there and that's why you went to surat but this is very interesting so you did quite a bit of market research and then you finalized Right. uh surat as a location because setting up a school in india is quite a herculean task in itself right you need to uh, follow a lot of uh, uh, i mean it's substantial investment also to set up i mean i'm assuming because in toc the running uh, dream is that some day we will have our own school <laughs> we are registered as a society so sometimes right. we talk with the community members and say we we think of starting a school of our own maybe a toc Uh, school because a lot of us are of the same but that is so inspiring to know so how how i mean just a side question to this i mean how long did you take time to do your market research and survey and then finalize surat i mean what It was the project about a I year mean? in fact the second year at i am ahmedabad uh, we spent a lot of time in doing this uh, we had a we had a uh, course called laboratory for entrepreneurial motivation it's run by professor sulil handa who is 
who is an IMA alumni and was a visiting faculty for this course. He's an entrepreneur himself and he runs uh, this school called Eklavya School in Ahmedabad. Some of you may have heard about the school. Mm, we have heard about the school, yeah. Yeah, Eklavya. Okay. yeah it's, it's, uh, uh, it's almost 25 years old now. So uh, okay. I think that uh, was one of the starting points to, uh, to in terms of research. And then uh, Ankita and I also did a one credit course uh, with the RGM uh, Center of Education and Innovation uh, at IIM Ahmedabad. We did a one credit course there on studying innovative uh, schools in India. So we actually, as a part of that, we actually visited 25 odd schools uh, at that point of time. Uh, and then uh, uh, to understand what is happening in India. So wow. that, that whole year we spent in like uh, do, doing research and talking to people, understanding what is happening. It was not, I, I would, I have to say that education was not the only thing we were looking at that point, at least in the start of that second year. Uh, mm -hmm. we, were, uh, we said, okay, let's look at all possible options of what we could be doing. Uh, and then distribution and retailing and manufacturing were all possibilities. But education, because of the, uh, because of the background I mentioned about myself being uh, some, uh, wanting to do something in education, wanting to make a difference there. And uh, the encouragement and mentorship of uh, Professor Neil Handa uh, both helped us to make that decision that, okay, this is the, I mean, the best time to do something uh, as risky as this is when we are young and fresh out of college. You Varman, know... I have to say this. Sorry, I have to jump in. Yeah, yeah mean... go ahead. Ahmedabad. Um, so I did my very early schooling in Ahmedabad. And um, interestingly enough, a lot of parents at that time were realizing that the Gujarat education system was really not good enough because there were mass promotions happening because of multiple challenges in the state. And I remember I was put in boarding school in Mount Abu and, uh, you know, which is a very popular <laughs> destination yeah. for a lot of us Gujaratis in Ahmedabad and around. But uh, at that time, there was hardly a few schools like Sant Kabir, for example, uh, who were around. And I really wish that we had a fountainhead back then in Ahmedabad because the options were so few. But as a Gujarati and as someone, as a native of the state, I cannot thank you enough for what you've done with Fountainhead because it is a very aspirational school, especially in a state like Gujarat and came at a very, very important time when families were giving up on the quality of education in the state. So, um, you know, phenomenal work there. And I have one question, uh, Ankur, if you allow me. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. How did you envision the international curriculum as a curriculum of choice for Fountainhead? Yeah, I think uh, that that would be the natural next question. How did we come up with international curriculum? So uh, we we started off uh, running the preschool first. I mean, in two thousand five. Uh, so like between two thousand four is when we graduated. Between two thousand four and five, we again took a year to uh, understand Surat uh, and dig deeper into education. Uh, understanding what is good education, you know, we, we of course didn't have a degree in uh, education. Uh, so we used uh, that time to understand good practices uh, uh, between Ankita and I, we read multiple books, did some courses. I mean, it wasn't a time of online courses so much. So it was like physical courses uh, at that point. Uh, and then uh, as so we started with the preschool, we didn't have, we didn't, we hadn't decided on uh, which curriculum we would do once we uh, set up a school. Uh, but in that process of the next three years or so, we were able to understand what is it that we want from education. And then we started looking around the, as to which board uh, of education seems to meet, uh, you know, that. Uh, so I, I'll put it this way. I mean, we wanted something which is uh, student-centered, uh, where you're learning skills uh, uh, and, you, you know, you're learning with uh, inquiry rather than learning uh, uh, I wrote memorizing information and giving examinations, which is well uh, how most of our education has been. Uh, it is the the NEP brings in uh, a bunch of changes. There's no doubt, but the implementation, at least as a policy, the implementation is another matter. Uh, so the IB came out to be the uh, closest from what we could understand. Uh, I, I would also say that it was uh, we 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 had limited understanding of what. Uh, IB also means because there were barely uh, 20 odd schools in India in 2003, 4, uh, 5. And when we started off with the PYP program, uh, which is the primary years program, uh, there were only 12, 13 schools in India at that point. And all of them were in uh, metros uh, is what I would think uh, is, is what I remember, I mean, uh, broadly. 
maybe one or two like nashik or some some such places so uh, i think the the ib curriculum was a big draw uh, from the whole inquiry philosophy to the uh, student student centeredness assessments being very uh, multifaceted uh, not just uh, exams uh, and uh, you know quizzes but you have a range of assessments performances and uh, process based journal based all of those things were a big draw for us and and when you i mean vardhan i think uh, in my homework about you and the school work that you have done at uh, the fountainhead school i mean two words keep coming repeating themselves i mean education should be meaningful and joyful and you yeah. just touched upon that i mean yeah. if you could just elaborate you know what 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 exactly when when you say meaningful and joyful and that is exactly what we lament that students go to and i i am telling you this i when i go to a school do a session and i have done quite a few of them the first question that i ask in any top school be it in india abroad is how many of you love coming to school on a monday yeah. and sadly i mean 8 out of 10 hands don't go up and they are like and i'll say how many of you love going to school not coming to school being on a weekend and yeah. eight hands will go up and yeah. i tell the students if and there are teachers in front and everybody the principal is there and and, say, and and these are the top schools of the country i will go to the best schools so when you say meaningful and joyful it strikes a uh, strikes a chord with me and the community because that is what we are struggling with if 10 year 11 50 teenagers don't feel good going to school they don't feel meaningful they don't feel joyful then what's the purpose of education right so if you can just tell uh, you know share your experience of how you make oh. school meaningful and joyful at fountainhead absolutely so let me just uh, uh, this is a question that i like you ask uh, students question i ask parents questions when they come in and you know they're looking for admission at our school uh, or anyone who's looking at uh, reimagining or rethinking education uh, i mean we do so much content but uh, in terms of you know uh, okay let, let's take the example that i take in the book like uh, we would all have studied quadratic equations in school uh it's the equation which is ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0 and there are yeah. four or five different methods of solving it uh my my question is not whether you know how to solve it uh if you're not a math teacher uh, or probably a physics teacher uh, you would not be solve you would not be able to solve it at this point also straight forward i mean that's not something all of uh, most of us would be able to do but more importantly uh what we've never learned the application of it either uh, we don't know where it is applied uh, we've just learned it because it was in the textbook uh, because our teacher was teaching it because it was going to come in uh, exam as an important uh, you know five marks 10 marks whatever number of marks uh, it was going to be about and this holds true for much of the concepts or content i wouldn't say concepts i would say content that we have done especially after grade 5 or 6 i mean i can take a sim more simple example from maths and talk about okay uh, and then maybe i i don't know if you have a, a hand raise system but let me see if uh, anyone has used uh, a square root in the last you know 5 years of their life uh, uh, just just for any any uh, applic other than teaching your kids if you have kids or uh, your or or teaching in school you've not even used a square root and and the problem is that uh so much there is so much content and this is not just about math of course if we talk about more traditional subjects of history and uh, uh geography and civics uh, but even science uh, science is all memorized uh, and you just go and uh, give exams based on okay what's the definition of photosynthesis or uh, memorizing the periodic table and its properties and just giving those answers now all of that basically means that when students are learning all this uh they don't see the connect of what they are learning with uh what is useful in real life uh they don't see that connect they, they they are able to also and as students all of us have probably asked that question that okay why am i learning this really i mean is it going to be of any use to me uh and, and most of us and and teachers really most typical answer is because it's there in the syllabus because it's there in the textbook it's there in the curriculum now that is not a convincing answer especially for teenagers uh the the primary kids uh, will will just do it because well they are uh, they are still uh, not asking those uh, critical questions uh, they are happy to learn whatever you are teaching them uh, they don't find necessarily joyfulness necessarily in that because the moment it is just for the sake of doing it 
uh, then you're not okay. If you're learning, say, something as simple as LCM uh, and HCF in maths, again, least common multiple, highest common fraction has very little application beyond uh, learning maths. And if you are unable to make those connections of real life applications of why you're learning something, then students don't find joy or meaning in that. Okay, so the meaning part is not coming there. The joy part comes from the method, the pedagogy. I mean, is it inquiry based or is it rote memorization? Are you doing hands-on stuff or are you just, uh, you know, uh, 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 memorizing it for the sake of the answer? So now that's where the joyfulness and the meaningfulness comes in, where you bring in a lot more hands-on, bring in experiential learning and wherever possible, or at least most of the time you're making connections with real life, where is this going to be used? Why are you learning this? And that's, that's how we can, and that's how we attempt to bring in uh, joy and meaning into the uh, classroom. Amazing. Wonderful. Wonderful to know that. I think that's the most important thing. And, and I'm connected to this is my next question. And we are now coming to the book. I mean, I mean, you are already doing fantastic work at the school and I mean, you could have, uh, you know, uh, done a lot of other things, but you chose to also write a book about your uh, experiences. So how did the idea of writing this big book come along? I mean, and then obviously, who do you think should read this uh, book and who should who is the right audience that will benefit from this book? So the idea of writing the book came, uh, I mean, was essentially there from quite some time. Also because my whole purpose of getting into education was to make a difference. Uh, uh, starting a school, running it uh, was uh, a big step, a big part of that journey. Uh, but now my next thought was after doing it for maybe 10, 12 years or almost 13, 14 years. Okay, how can I reach out to a larger audience, communicate, I mean, some ideas. It's not necessarily that I have the best ideas or we're doing everything perfectly. I don't think we're anywhere near that. Uh, uh, but at least... There are some learnings uh, that I uh, think that I can share, uh, and that's where the uh, the, exp the the uh, uh, the intent of uh, writing the book comes from. Uh, and then, if you and I, I, uh, I can assure you that if you read the book, uh, you would be able to connect to pretty much everything that's there. You would say, "Oh yeah, I have also experienced this. I've also seen this." Uh, even if you're not a teacher, uh, you would uh, have seen it, uh, 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 experienced the same thing as a student or even as a someone who's associated with education very closely uh, in, in non-teaching roles. Uh, so you would be able to connect very well and you would say, yeah, this makes a lot of sense and we need to be changing this. Uh, the problem is that we don't know where to change it and how to go in that direction. That's where we get stuck, uh, which is what my, so the first part is about problems and the second part is about possible solutions. Again, definitely not the, the, the best solutions or the only solutions, uh, but definitely uh, one, uh, direction that can be taken so that's the thought process behind the book uh, and, and and I think so given that context uh, given that context I feel that uh, uh, I, I feel that uh, anyone who is very closely uh, associated with education should definitely read it uh, parents would also benefit but it may get a little heavy for parents after a certain point because it's meant for uh, people who are in the education uh, sector teachers, uh, counselors, uh, uh, of course, anyone who's related to education. Amazing. Thank you. And I'm just, uh, sh I've shared the Amazon link or the book uh, in the chat and I'm also sharing the screen. I hope you can see it. I mean, uh, it's, it's highly rated. I mean, I can see 4.7 stars, 24 ratings. I mean, and I definitely have ordered my own copy after we set up this interview uh, process. And the conversation, because the the moment I went through the index and I went through the summary of the book and then I read some reviews about your book, everybody is exactly saying the same thing, that all of us have experienced the challenges that you have mentioned here in some part or the other, either in full or in some part. And we feel so connected to what you're trying to do. But uh, Vardhan, I mean, and, and you are a very, you know, very well-known face now with Fountainhead School and... Uh, and and we are talking about a lot of issues uh, with our education system. Uh, but there are two aspects to it uh, uh, also. I mean, there is a good and there is a bad. Before we come to the challenges, I'd also like to talk to you about what do you think are the, I mean, uh, uh, the strengths of the Indian education system? Because 
uh one of the things that i feel is we 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 lament about our indian education system is rote learning we say oh we are always about rote learning rote learning rote learning. but when we travel in the west they have their own challenges where they feel that there are students i mean i i'm going talking from my own experience they feel that you know our children children are not good at rote learning and we need some of that also so i mean there is a balance that needs to be struck i mean i am i am coming from a liberal arts background i work with ashoka and jindal yeah, talking yeah. about liberal arts all the way yeah. but when i used to travel to us and canada and these places yeah. they were like oh indians are so good at being doctors and engineers yeah. and yeah. i mean all of you are like uh, it professionals there or you are like ceo of microsoft or you know google ceo and they see these poster boys of it tech and then you go to us all the doctors are indians most of them and uk and all these places and they feel that that's good because our children here in the west are not taking the heavy subjects which is like maths and science and they are going for the thought of social science subjects which are much more easier in a in their own uh, understanding so what do you think are the good things that we are trying to do here at indian education so i i know you sent me this question i was i had to think really hard about this uh, no. <laughs> so i'll tell you uh, <laughs> and the, reason for it, the reason for it is not that uh, okay let me put it this way that one there is a public education and there is a private education let's put it this way in india uh, as far as k12 is concerned uh, public education uh, uh, is 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 well behind uh, all all parameters that it needs to be so it's difficult to say uh, anything good and i'm not talking about higher education there are there are fantastic higher education uh, institutes which are public education so uh, i have been to two of them so uh, so so obviously uh, there are fantastic ones i mean that are there but as far as k12 is concerned uh public education is nowhere near up to mark and there are states which are trying to do some things but they are still well behind and we we have nearly 50 to 55% of our kids still go there so let's also be clear mm-hmm. about of the remaining of the remaining so uh, 45% or so most of the kids are studying in schools are are essentially what are called budget private schools or uh, uh, which which serve low income families Uh, and again for them if they can just get to uh, foundational literacy numeracy do that well i think that's a big achievement uh, that also is something that they do struggle with so when we talk about at a scale uh, i i i wouldn't find much to say that okay we've been doing something really well that's something that uh, that's my honest i mean and strong opinion on that particular point yes we have a lot of because we also operate at scale there are obviously good quality private institutions which have been there for a long time uh, some of our curriculum also has been because it has been grounded strongly in uh, i wouldn't say only in the maths and science but even in in other subjects but there is those students who are able to do well uh, are also able to progress well whether it is in engineering medical it or so many other fields uh, that uh, indians are good at uh, but i would also say that much of it much of the excellence that we see in the corporate world or even in the academic world is uh, in spite or despite of the education it is not thanks to the education obviously when there are i mean at this point today uh, cbse alone uh, there are 10 to 12 lakh students uh, uh, giving the 12th, uh, 12th examinations each year and if you look at all students giving 12th examinations we are talking about a very very large number i i i remember i think it's 2 uh, 3 crores if i if i remember correctly now in that number obviously we are going to have very smart people who are going to go on become who are going to become uh, very good engineers uh, uh, i see when we say very good engineers also let us be clear that most people going from coming from the iits don't do engineering right uh, all of us yeah, yeah. all of us already yeah. know that they are not really doing engineering they are all in they are doing they are becoming stand up comics vardhan <laughs> also yeah. Also, also, but they're doing everything else except engineering. So now it's not the institutions is not what is contributing. Obviously, when the funnel is uh, when the funnel is so competitive, uh, you are going to find I mean very good people coming out of that funnel in any case. So that is not surprising to me. Uh, and there are, as I said, public institutions. There are very good ones uh, which do a good job when it comes to higher education. So there is obviously uh, they made a name uh, for Indian education uh, and for themselves. but that does not reflect uh, greatly on uh, the 
the, the education itself is what I can uh, say. Uh, and, and I can also say, I mean, and, and you said you've been to so many uh, foreign universities. I agree. Uh, foreign schools. I'm not saying that what uh, uh, someone else is doing is perfect. I don't think uh, there are uh, pretty much every education system in the world is struggling in, in some way or the other. We are struggling at scale. Uh, we are struggling at, with foundational literacy numeracy. They are struggling with uh, purpose. They are struggling with you know uh, keeping students motivated to study. Uh, uh, STEM is a definitely a struggle area for them. So you're right. I mean, I, I don't think there is a perfect system. But these are just some thoughts that I have. Vardhan, very interestingly, you mentioned uh, the diversity of challenges depending on which country and in a country like India, it's not even about the country, it's about the state or the yes. the, the, the very local area that you cater to. Right. Um, and, and unless you're a boarding school, you are going to have to look at the community around you uh, to make sure that your school is actually making an impact and is meeting the needs of the community around you or filling the gaps. Um, we've seen a phenomenal rise in the number of private universities in India. And so it seems like a lot of uh, entrepreneurs or businessmen or politicians with deep pockets are choosing to invest in higher education. Do you think that we are seeing uh, enough uh, investment in K-12, uh, in quality schools and as an entrepreneur yourself in the space, um, what is your view on the current uh, volume uh, with respect to the demand of quality of education? And what is your advice to anyone who can think in that direction or who should potentially think of starting yeah. a school? Yeah. Ankur, can, I, can, I, can we also connect this with the question that you have in drawing of lots? I mean, because it's a very... Uh, for yeah, idea. yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, I can, I can do that. I mean, uh, I mean that was my, our next question. Correct. I Correct. mean, you suggested. I mean, uh, for those of you who may not know, I mean, I loved when I was doing my research in one of the blog posts that Vardhan has written. Uh, he says that you know a lot of the issues, the mental health issues, the student suicide problems that are happening with some very bright students committing suicide, and we know we are very passionate about the same issue. We have been talking over and over again. I mean, the stress on students, the quota factory, the, I mean, we have, we know it all. And then he had a very interesting take on it. And he said, probably have an all India entrance examination for the first 200,000 rank holders. You draw lots and then depending on the lots, you allocate uh, IIT uh, seats to the students and not on merit. It's just a lot lottery system. And that was very interesting take. And I had put it down specifically as our next question here. Over to you, Vardhan. I mean, yeah, I accept yeah. the context so, and then you can add. So I, I, the reason I'm putting that question here is also because the, there is obviously a big, huge mismatch between the demand and the supply for uh, high quality uh, higher education, good quality higher education. That's the reason why uh, there is so much craze and uh, madness about the JE and the NEET. Uh, let's be honest. It is not that people, uh, parents or their kids want to become uh, engineers or doctors at any cost. It is because that's the route that they see to success in life. Uh, and this is especially true for anyone who does not have the means to be in a good quality, progressive, uh, good quality, progressive uh, private university. Uh, some of those which uh, I'm, I'm sure many of those which you uh, represent here, uh, including the ones I mean, uh, you know, but this uh, mentioned. So I have no doubts that there is a huge mismatch between uh, between uh, the, the supply and demand. Uh, and I don't think we are anywhere close to the kind of investment and the numbers uh, of uh, higher, uh, both higher ed as well as private schools that are required uh, in terms of you know, new good quality ones. So, uh, and, and the reason why, uh, and I think there is, regulation is a big problem. There is no doubt that uh, regulation is a huge issue. Uh, education is uh, still meant to be non-profit in India, uh, uh, higher education or uh, K-12 education, and which is why the investment does not come from, say, a corporate, I mean, so much. It comes from the kind of people that Bhakti mentioned, builders and politicians and, you know, people with uh, deep pockets who can also manage the regulatory aspects uh, much better. There are some. But, uh, you know, Ashoka is an example, ISB is another example, uh, and many, OP Jindal, of course, and so many others. But there are very few of these. Uh, we, need, we need hundreds more of uh, 
these institutions to be serving our students and 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 i think a simple statistic that i came across which uh, which which uh, shows the supply demand gap is that indian students are spending about uh, upwards of 40 billion dollars annually on uh, education abroad uh, and i just and and the comparison of that is best made with our fuel our fuel import bill our fuel import bill for the same year is about 120 billion dollars now our students on education abroad we are spending one third of our fuel import bill now that's the extent to which uh, we lack good education uh, if we had those opportunities in india so many more students would be would be uh, would remain in india uh, so I, I i think that's just the broader point i wanted to make it interesting absolutely I mean, there are a couple of questions that I want to ask. I mean, there are more than a couple, but I also want to go into the audience Q&A because there are yeah. quite a few questions that have come beforehand. Uh, so audience, if you have a question, uh, you can please use raise hand option or you can type in your questions. I will take in the questions that I, we have already got on the chat box. I mean, I have uh, one question from Shweta Khanna. Uh, I mean, uh, my question to Vardhan will be specific best practices adopted at Fountainhead to make education meaningful and joyful. I mean, if you can just share a couple of practices that, I mean, best practices that you can, practical tips that you can give to the audience. So I, I'll talk about two things. Uh, while there are uh, maybe many, I mean, I couldn't talk about 20, 25 things, but I'll just talk about two specific things for now. Uh, one of the things that, we are now doing, especially in the last five, six years, a lot more is to move towards project-based learning, uh, uh, at least from like grade three onwards. Uh, and it's not going to be exclusively project-based learning. It is, uh, it is also going to be project-based learning. And the and and the difference between and I know that uh, uh, a lot of schools or a lot of educators are familiar with project-based learning. But one big difference is that uh, when we talk about project-based learning. The project is not the desert at the end of a typical unit. Uh, the project is the main course in that sense. That's the analogy that uh, people who are familiar with project-based learning would use, uh, where the project is trying to address an authentic real-life problem uh, or uh, where students are trying to find a solution to a real-life issue that they can identify and work around it. Uh, and in an example of the, it could be that, okay, uh, uh, students in our school identify the need of a greenhouse because there are certain uh, vegetables and flowers that do not grow in the weather of Surat. Then they decided to put together a greenhouse uh, and they studied the biology and the chemistry and the physics of setting up a greenhouse and put it together. So that's one example. The other thing which uh, I think uh, uh, all of you will be able to relate to uh, very well is we, we, we do something called change the narrative, especially once student, students enter grade 8, grade 9. Uh, and we do this whole process with parents and students and teachers and ask them that, okay, what are your real goals in life? Do not just be driven by grades and marks uh, that, okay, without a certain grade in a certain subject uh, or certain subjects altogether, you're not going to be successful because, and we do this, uh, we do this exercise with uh, parents and ask them to list who are, uh, what are the attributes or characteristics of people who uh, they know are successful in life. Uh, and all of those characteristics and attributes are 21st century skills and attitudes like leadership and teamwork and vision and dedication, uh, you know, all of these things. Uh, no one, no one says that you need to have 90% marks or uh, a grade A or a 42 or whatever it is uh, to be successful in life. Uh, yes, university admissions do require a certain grade uh, and that's uh, and that also, but there is a whole range of university. It's not that there is only one sort of universities. Uh, but is that your dream? Is that your goal? Is that the only route to success for you in life? If that is something that we can talk about to parents and students effectively, a lot of their stress, a lot of their uh, mental health issues uh, becomes less. It doesn't go away uh, because obviously the whole that whole period of uh, admissions is, is stressful as a, as a whole. But at least you know that there are so many more routes to success in life and not just narrow paths uh, to success. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Varvan. I see Kala has raised her hand. Kala, you want to go ahead. 
Thanks, um, thanks, Ankur. Um, hi, hi, Vardhan. Um, of course, I've delved into different aspects of your book, and this goes with multiple questions, but let's kind of prioritize. There's two things I want to kind of ask you, uh, but in terms of priority, one is let's look at the learning uh, needs, right? The learning, our learner profiles have considerably changed. When you're talking 21st century, we know from 20 years ago, learner profile has changed. And one of the biggest changes has been attention span. Uh, and that's a huge change in, in the whole schooling system. And that's not just for students, for professionals. You're always on multiple devices while you're studying. Yeah. And hence, what's what's been one of the biggest observations that you see uh, in that kind of learner profile? Also, given that you're not a big endorser for external discipline, right? So you've kind of said, you one must have self-regulated discipline. However, there is this whole distortion of uh, learning, you know, the disruptions are pretty extensive. So I'm very interested in, in that because in many senses, every learner today has become a special learner. There was a time when you could talk about students with less attention span as a special learner, but now you, you're seeing this is pretty much the problem that every learner is facing. So I'm very interested in that. Um, although my second question was around uh, assessment versus stackable units for competencies, but I won't delve into yeah. that. For me, probably priority will be my first question. Thanks. No, you're you're absolutely right, Kala. I think uh, attention spans have reduced uh, significantly over the last, uh, say, decade or so, and especially post, uh, I mean, during and post pandemic, uh, and then during pandemic when students had complete freedom of being on devices all day. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, playing games and doing all kinds of things which uh, no one could really track beyond the point. Uh, so absolutely, you're right. I think the solution to that is uh, is is rooted in, is rooted in. Sorry, I'm getting back. Yeah, I think the solution to that is rooted in uh, having the right usage of technology at the right age. Appropriate usage is important. There is a lot of, uh, uh, so for example, we don't have, uh, we barely have any technology usage till grade four or so. Uh, and then grade five onwards, there is technology use, but it is uh, controlled in school. And we also work with parents to make sure it is controlled at home. But there are limitations to what we can do uh, with respect to home, uh, home related and controls. So I think teenagers, uh, I think as you mentioned, adults also have a difficult time uh, maintaining attention span, uh, whether it is an online workshop, even a face-to-face -face workshop for that matter, or any such thing. I think all of us need to find techniques uh, ourselves to deal with it. And therefore, we need to be also teaching those techniques to students. So we do extensive sessions, especially once students are in middle school and beyond on, uh, you know, uh, all, all the issues that they face. So procrastination monkey, if you've uh, seen that video, we, we do workshops around that. We, we teach them Pomodoro techniques. We teach them how to schedule their day, including time for social media and playing games. Uh, you know, so they need to have that uh, because if we just have one narrow thing, then it just doesn't doesn't help, especially with teenagers. Uh, they need to have those outlets. Uh, so it's a lot of conversation. Uh, uh, last two three years, we've also started doing uh, uh, twice a week advisories with our students, especially the high school students. So speaking to them on a very regular basis, building that connect. So we play, so the advisors play a lot of games with them, have a lot of fun with them to so make strong connections and therefore are able to then teach them all of these things. Because otherwise we also know that teenagers uh, are not very easy. I mean, they don't want to learn all of these things easily. So they don't take advice. Uh, but when you do it through all of these uh, methods, they're far more likely to uh, take up this now we've seen examples of students coming back and saying earlier they didn't uh, make a timetable. Uh, six months down the line, they said, oh, no, I need help in making a timetable for myself, a study uh, timetable for myself back at home because I'm not being able to concentrate. So those are the things that we need to do on a, on a regular basis. With. And I do, but I don't think there are any easy answers to this. Thank you. Thank you, Vardhan. Neeraj, you can go ahead. Yeah, excellent conversation going on, Vardhan. So, uh, so my question is, uh, 
like there are a lot of stakeholders who want to improve the quality of education uh, one of the stakeholders obviously is the school parents are there but uh, there are a lot of other stakeholders like uh, out of the school and uh, like coaching institutes and uh, online courses etc uh, i know it's a bit of a controversial thing to talk about right now but my uh, like since you are somebody who has been in the education and uh, has understood from the schooling system if there are stakeholders who want to contribute and uh, make schools or parents uh, a part of it what do you think is an approach uh, which actually works on the ground because uh, it's like online courses are competing with schools uh, there are very good uh, stem providers who are creating excellent content but they become more like vendors sometimes so uh, what is it's a it's a functional as well as over uh, remark i want from you as to how uh, the collaboration can increase right uh, i i think it's a tricky bit simply because uh, i mean i i and I, and we meet a lot of uh, you know uh, people who've uh, built uh, fantastic things uh, and, and you know want to be uh, as a school i mean and and we are still uh, doing an international curriculum we have a lot more flexibility but most schools have very little flexibility in their in their regular timetable or in the uh, number of units and subjects that they have to take up. Uh, so it is very challenging for them to bring it into the school timetable. And typically, if you have something fantastic, uh, it is either going to take uh, uh, more time uh, or it is going to cost more uh, or it is typically going to be both. Now, for that, uh, <laughs> it is typically going to be... Now, that becomes a uh, proposition which most schools stay away from because, well, uh, it, 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 time and money is both, I mean, a big challenge for them to carve out. So, unfortunately, a lot of this happens after school, uh, you know, the experiential learning or critical thinking workshops or all, all these kind of things are happening after school. Now, in reality, they need to be part of the... Uh, uh, core curriculum for uh, for students and they need to be doing it on an ongoing basis i mean your students are learning tons and tons of uh, content which is meaningful well they could be learning skills and attitudes which will be far far more useful for them so uh, i don't have an answer for you in reality what i can say is that there are there are there are many more progressive schools which are open to doing this nowadays uh, so you have to work deeply with them uh, and and build that uh, build that uh, curriculum uh, alongside the schools uh, rather than trying to do it independently of the schools. Now that also works, but it has its own limitations. As uh, I mean, I'm sure you would know. Uh, so if and and because uh, especially I think in tier one, even tier two cities, there is uh, a lot more competition for progressive schools. So schools also want to show uh, these things as USPs. The only thing is. Uh, that uh, both the service provider as well as the school needs to have conviction in the idea because the results of all of these things are not visible immediately. The results may take uh, two years. Typically, they would take five years, seven years. Now, that conviction has to be there because parents will only appreciate it after you can show those results in a slightly longer period of time. And nobody wants to wait that long. That is Absolutely. what I have learned. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Everybody wants. I was right, talking to. Has to be a long term game. That is the that is the problem and I... the beauty of it. <laughs> I was once talking to a bureaucrat. I still remember yeah. this conversation a couple of years back. I think somewhere, and I asked him why don't we invest in education? And I see a lot of uh, investment happening in infrastructure and everywhere. He says that it's easier to showcase, right? Absolutely. Uh, and who will wait till five years, 10 years for a result to come out of an educational institution when you can, uh, I mean, I'm not saying they need it. We definitely need that also, but definitely we need something in education also. I mean, that's the no, one way simple of... Call it, the, the election cycle is a five-year cycle. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and it's the actually faster a five-year cycle. It's actually a three-year cycle because... The last yeah. few years are all about campaigning. So if you can't show results yeah. by that time, yeah, um, you would rather not invest. Uh, invest. Yeah. You know, Ankur, it's the same analogy, Vardhan and Ankur, for university recruitment. Why are you not investing in outreach and thought leadership and capacity building? And why are you investing in channel partners and agents? Because yeah. they give you good outcomes. So that's just what it is, right? Like instant results. 
that is what i have learned in life mm-hmm. and i thought only few places <laughs> that i worked in the past had this problem but when i go around the world the same problem exists instant gratification all of us need instant gratification i mean i i am investing so much and then i need 2x 3x 4x whatever now not 2 years 3 years down the line this sad part of it i mean and we then we talk about you know planting the seed watering it then the plant will come out and the fruit may be coming out of <laughs> 4 or 5 years i mean koi sunta nahi hai hamari baat sorry Absolutely. okay so i'll i will i i have one very important question i mean one of the most passionate person to ask this question he is not here but he has typed in at least 300 words for this question so i need to i won't write out everything his name is himanshu and himanshu is a independent uh, international consultant and he is a very passionate educator passionate tocn and he was very excited that you are coming and he was the first one to type in that question uh, i'm not reading out the whole question but he says i mean in the current context and he alludes to the uh, issues at uh, you know harvard president resigning and you know a lot of couple of other ivy league presidents were asked to resign and uh, and 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 the the whole situation around the the war uh, happening and very polarized world that we are living in where facts take a back seat and it's more about emotions and politics and everything i mean he says um, what will be your advice to students in schools so who who are looking to go to universities or studying in educational institutions most of the time the students uh you know goal posts are related to job or a family uh, the near and dear ones but as a global citizen what is it that you know what then will like to advise the youngsters that are going to enter university soon no i think uh, firstly i think building I, I, i mean i i want to connect like make it in two parts that uh, and i think you had this question about uh, what would be the advice to students for whom the revolution may be too late for them yeah to... absolutely i like to read that question out to... i'll read, read that question out because and that's that's one thing that uh, good we can connect the, these two questions i mean i had uh, mentioned what will be your advice to students for whom the revolution may be too late i mean we don't have a fountain head in every district of this country i would mean, we have only it in surat and maybe few other good schools but not as you said public education will it takes its own time but how do we help these students how do we ensure that they do not get shortchanged by the current education system that they have to uh, go through with so over to you so i i think the good thing is uh, thanks to the internet uh, thanks to youtube now uh, generative ai i think learning has been democratized uh, there is so much uh, that students can learn on their own uh, and what they need to recognize is that the jobs of today as well as if they want to do something on their own require uh, deep skills uh, expertise in an area uh, plus you need to have so many of these uh, general uh, skills whether it is leadership teamwork you know uh, vision oriented uh, being able to focus all of those things that is what they should be developing their school or most likely their college may also not be teaching them if they are not going to a progressive uh, school or a college if they've not had the opportunity to go to one uh, but they have the opportunity to learn all of these things uh, and no one is stopping them that that i truly believe in uh, that no one is stopping them no one can stop them if they take that responsibility and learn uh, there are uh, online courses service providers which will do that but you can also do it uh, at a very low cost at or, or or at no cost so i think and they have to take on projects and challenges and internships you know to really learn and prepare themselves for the world of uh, work rather than just aiming to get degrees which have very limited value uh, even even for the first job if especially like if you're in uh, so many tech companies now are hiring on the basis of github projects uh, and not on the basis of the degree or uh, your resume or your marks so now uh, now that's not so easy to do in non tech jobs but it's ha- going to happen more and more uh, in in that direction so that's you know on the part of being ready for the world of uh, work uh, but as far as global citizenship is concerned i think uh, youngsters do tend to either be indifferent or they tend to jump to conclusions very quickly or take up take a side very quickly yeah so yeah. i think neither of those are helpful uh, to be global citizens they have to uh, 
really think deep, understand uh, the issues deeply. Uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, you could take a very quick, uh, you know, side and say that uh, this is right and this is wrong. But in reality, I mean, it is a very, very complex and a very uh, deep, long-term issue. I mean, it's been decades in the making. So uh, students have to uh, be advised and they should be uh, exposed to uh, forums where they can understand all aspects. I mean, not just, and then deeply think critically about uh, aspects and not uh, jump to conclusion, say that, okay, he's right and they are wrong or, uh, or, or even saying something as simple as key, climate change is wrong and therefore we should stop using fossil fuels altogether. That's not going to happen, right? So uh, what's, yeah. what's going to happen is things like the COP20 resolution that the COP28 took, small changes, but at least if it is in the right direction uh, and they can contribute to it directly or indirectly, that's the best that uh, I think uh, students can do. Perfect. So I will take one final question because we have run out of time. Uh, just a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, I don't know, tutor, I don't know the, your name. It's not there, but I'll take your question. Uh, uh, what were the challenges, roadblocks that uh, Vardhan faced while running Fountainhead School? And what is next next in his to-do list for Vardhan? I mean, quickly, if you want to. Yeah, I can quickly answer that. See, the, the initial challenges were about uh, land fun funding, regulation, you know, uh, although regulation is an ongoing challenge, uh, but that was the initial challenge for sure. Once that was in place, I think it was, uh, then it was a learning journey. There were challenges like, okay, how do you, uh, how do you uh, build a high uh, generation of high quality teachers who themselves gone to very traditional schools themselves? So how do you do that? Uh, so we had to evolve our own training process, uh, teacher training process for it. Uh, how do you uh, convince parents about, I mean, the need for a progressive education? Again, we we do a workshop with them and it keeps, it goes on and on so that they are in the right frame of mind. So I think those are challenges which, uh, which, which, which were uh, fantastic learning opportunities. Uh, I think today's challenges are not so much in terms of uh, any of these, but uh, it can be connected to the next step. What do we? What do I want to do next? And I think for me, uh, the, the both the challenge and the interest is to be able to now uh, uh, make a difference at a bigger scale in whatever way possible. And the book is uh, an, an, uh, a big part of uh, that initiative. Uh, so uh, talk to as many stakeholders as possible. Try and you know bring about a, a change in the mind. A change in the mindset. Uh, of people who matter, uh, policy makers, decision makers, uh, people who are working closely with schools and uh, uh, schools and students. So that's my, I would say, broader uh, next step. Uh, within that, the exact nature of how things will work is something I'm still, you know, it's a, a discovery process that's on right now. Thank you so much, uh, Vardhan, for that wonderful conversation. We really enjoyed it. I mean, as I imagined it, this has been better than that. Uh, thank you so much uh, on behalf of the Outreach Collective. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude on behalf of the community, uh, my co-founder, Bhakti. Uh, I mean, uh, it's been an honor to have you here with us, uh, talking about your book, talking about your viewpoints on education and quite a few of other things under the sun. I have shared the Amazon link on the chat section for everybody who wants to order that book. It's an amazing book. I've already ordered my copies and there were others who have already done that or started reading it. Uh, and I'm also shared my screen for people to just have a, a look at what the book looks like. Uh, and uh, that's about it for us this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back soon with another uh, interesting personality and uh, inspiring personality who is reimagining the way education should be and what we all believe in, resonate with as a community. We will definitely look forward to uh, having more of such conversation. Thank you, Vardhan. Thank you, everyone. It's a, Have a good night and see you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, TOC, for this wonderful session. Thank you. Namaskar.